Okay, well, it's uh, like the 8th or 9th of May, and it's time to do the first seedings for the 2017 uh, corn breeding project. And I thought I would just talk a little bit about the corns that I'm adding into my corn projects this year and why I'm excited about each of these individual corns. And I am always learning new things about corn and so my corn projects are kind of like in this permanent state of modification and change because I am growing these corns for our personal use and my personal enjoyment so I don't have you know like a rigid solid set goal and if I find out about an interesting corn that I want to add into my project, I'm, I, you know, I glom onto it if I can and try it. So one of the things that I do is I start successions. A lot of these corns are from Mexico and South America and the tropical regions of the world. And they have adaptations that are not necessarily well adapted to the day length and the season length that we have here. So you have to jump through some hoops to get them produce viable seed in this environment. And the other thing is I don't want some of those negative adaptations transferred into uh, the corns that I'm already growing that are becoming more well adapted to this environment. So one of the things that I do and one of the great things about corn is it's actually very easy to control the pollination of the corn that you're growing by detasseling the the variety that you do not want spreading its pollen and so then next year I can assess well at the end of the year I can assess which of these if any of them I liked their you know their qualities and which of them I really want to continue to add into my project and so we're gonna have you know 15 to 20 um, plants for each of the projects in this first seeding. And then in about two or three weeks, I'll do another identical seeding in trays, like in plug sheets like this. And then on top of that, I will also do, I will direct seed these corns into the field with the project. So I'll have three separate plantings of these corns. So that way I have these different corns coming along at different moments in time and hopefully that one you know one of those three if not more than one will have uh the right timing uh, hopefully that makes sense so let's talk about these specific corns that i'm that i'm starting with i have a couple of i have one corn that i got from another corn breeding friend i have a corn that i bought from uh, native seed search and then i have four corns that i got from the usda through the ars grin which is the Specifically, the corn is all coming from the North Central Regional PI station. So let's talk about the flower corn. So I've got three corns that I'm adding into my flower corn project this year, or at least potentially. And this one, Zapalote Chico, is the one I'm most excited about. Zapalote Chico is a very uh, interesting corn. Although I guess I'm going to probably say they're all interesting corns because they are interesting to me. But Zapalote Chico is an interesting corn from Oaxaca. And you can see it's kind of a white, flowery, dent corn. And the, one of the reasons I'm interested in Zapalote Chico is it's from Oaxaca, which is kind of the cradle uh, birthplace of one of the cradle birthplaces of corn center of diversity. So Oaxacan corn is very genetically diverse and interesting. And then this corn is also um, unique in that it has been uh, scientifically analyzed and it has what Zapalote Chico does is it has a, uh, a genetic capacity for producing uh, this chemical called mason which is a glycoside which is deposited in the silk and it is toxic to uh, corn earworm. So it has a natural defensive chemical in the, the silks, which uh, actually is toxic to uh, the insect pests. So that's a really interesting trait for me as I'm trying to grow uh, corn 
organically with no pesticides and kind of low uh, input structures. So a corn that has natural defensive chemicals from insects is really interesting to me. So that's why one of the reasons I'm interested in Zapalote Chico is because it has that uh, maizen content in, in the plant. And it's also, you know, in Oaxaca, this is a corn that's considered a premium uh, corn for making tortillas. So it's, you know, it's like a edible corn. And one of the really exciting things that I get from Mexican corns is all of these corns are grown by indigenous cultures in Mexico, either Native American or uh, Mexican cultures, where and they are using them for making food for human consumption rather than corns that have been bred for you know animal feed or for the corn syrup market or whatever you want to call it so these are corns that are actively used and selected by people for direct human consumption and potentially you know are more flavorful and uh better for making things like tortillas i'm always looking to you know improve my corns you know tortilla quality in terms of flavor and structure and uh texture okay so I'm hopeful that these, all of these corns will have improved flavor and textural qualities for a, you know, once they're nixtamalized. So that's Zapalote Chico. And if you're interested in that, that's um, PI number 618810. Okay. And then I have, the other two corns I have are both from uh, northwestern Mexico. Um, I have one called Maicova Sonora. And one is called El Fuerte, and El Fuerte is PI number 503577, and uh, uh, Maikova is 503570. And these are both from the uh, corn race known as uh, uh, Blandito de Sonora, and even though El Fuerte is from Sinaloa, it's uh, it's still in that uh, primary race. And that's a sort of a flower corn. Flowery corn. Actually, this looks kind of more, this is uh, Maikova, and this one looks more denty, but you know, it's sort of a white, flowery, denty. Um, there's some yellow kernels here, but um, I'm interested in its qualities because, you know, it's in Sinaloa and Sonora, like sort of very dry, arid environments, and I'm interested in uh, these corns that are primarily tortilla corns. Uh, I just want to include, you know, some more diverse genetics, you know, from, uh, especially from the nor desert northwest Mexico, Sonora, uh, Tar the Tarahumara culture, um, things like that. It's just, and I can't 100% explain why I get excited about specific corns, but I got interested in the Tarahumara culture and you know the way that they use corn and they're sort of famous for their uh, dependence on corn and then you know they have their, their long distance running uh, capacity and anyway I, I wanted to include some you know Sonoran and Sinaloan and uh, Tarahumara corns in my project because I didn't have any genetics from that area okay so all I'm, all I'm gonna do, plus, and I sort of, like this one didn't have a name, it's just got a PI number, and but it was from this town called El Fuerte in Sinaloa, and I just really like that name, you know? And sometimes that, you know, I would love to live in a town, you know, this is the corn from the place, the strong place, right? So, um, yeah, uh, sometimes it's just that, whimsical right so uh anyhow all we do and we'll just start in the middle here on el fuerte because i'm and this is a pretty nice uh there's no yellow in this el fuerte so i'm not concerned about selection for endosperm quote color so i'm just looking at you know sort of the floweriest looking kernels i can see here in my hand um to try and just do a little bit of selection like that 
anything that looks very glassy I'm rejecting because I'm just going to have to select away from that later because uh, that's flinty or endosperm you know and this is a flower corn project it's not that hard though like I've talked about that in the Xenia video so there's El Fuerte now this one, this Maikova got a lot of yellow endosperm but I can I can work with it there's a lot of white too this Zapalote Chico has like some purple looks like it's got a purple cob I also see some like stringy uh, stringy there's a little bit of sort of like purple chin mark uh, pericarp here so there's clearly a little bit of color genetics per colored pericarp genetics and colored cob genetics here but that's fine too okay so now we've got all these kernels so we just push them slightly into the soil here everything a nice covering in terms of transplanting corn tra corn like most grasses transplants very readily um, I find it you want to get it out of these plug sheets and into the field before you get what's called V5, which is um, the fifth leaf, the fifth true leaf that uh, comes out of the plant is when you can see the actual ligule and leaf collar of that fifth leaf, that's called V5. And uh, Anywhere up to that, if you get to V6, you're probably going to have some problems with stunting and uh, root, you know, overgrowth, and it'll prematurely flower. It, you know, so you anything up to V5, you're fine in my experience. But I mean, that could vary based on the genetics of the corn. I'm sure there are corns that could not tolerate being in the tray that long and there's probably corns that could tolerate being in the tray a lot longer than that and it may also be a function of how big are your cells that your corns are in and these are fairly small cells this is a 50 cell plug sheet um yeah so your mileage may vary but that's been my general experience Okay, so now we've got three corns that I'm putting into my flint corn project. And this first corn is called Chapalote. And it is also a corn from uh, the Sonoran region of Mexico. And it is uh, also considered a primary race of corn. Um, it's sort of a flinty popcorn with sort of this characteristic brown uh, pericarp and uh, one of the the, re the main reason I'm really interested in Chapalote is because I saw a post by Frank Kutka last year where he was commenting on how he'd seen some Chapalote grown in North Dakota and it had the most incredibly robust root system he'd ever seen on a corn plant and Frank Kutka is one of my sort of plant breeding mentors, even though I haven't personally met with him, but he, we've, you know, emailed back and forth a few times, and he's got a lot of great videos on YouTube, actually, on how to hand pollinate corn and select corn, and he's a professional corn breeder and plant breeder in North Dakota, um, and he used to be the editor of uh, Corn Culture magazine, um, or the Corn Culture newsletter, 
So he's he's a very interesting guy, and like if he says something, a particular corn is remarkable. That you know perks my ears up. So this corn is really interesting. I'm really interested in you know seeing the root system and how it develops. The one thing, well, obviously I'm not crazy about this brown pericarp. So um, we obviously I will be uh, detasseling all of this chapalote because I don't want any of these brown pericarp genes getting back into my flint corn because I am I'm trying to completely eliminate you know colored pericarp genes from my flint corn project. But be that as it may, since I'm going to detassel this stuff, I'm happy to put it into my project. Um, and I don't know what color the endosperm is on this stuff. But I suspect it very likely is white. Um, incidentally, these little envelopes, you know, these brown envelopes with the, you know, they, they've got mylar inside. Awesome. I'm pretty, you know, you can, you can, uh, they've even got this area up here where you can um, do like a heat seal. Pretty freaking cool. You can buy these from Southern Exposure. Um, if anybody else knows another source for these envelopes, I would love to know because I really, really want some. Uh, okay, so there's Chapalote. Then we got this one, which is I, I got from Native Seed Search, and they're calling it Tarahumara Golden Cristalino. So, or Golden Cristalino. Um, the names that Native Seed Search gives to their corns are a little bit sketchy, and actually, there's a lot about native seed search that I find sketchy related to corn, but we won't go into that. But I was, you know, interested in this. It's a Tarahumara corn. It's from the same region that Chapalote is from. So I was like, well, maybe this corn might be even better than the Chapalote because it's from the same region. It may have the same root structure and it doesn't have this colored pericarp, which is a plus, you know, and it's, and it's yellow endosperm already. So I was like, potentially this corn would be a good one to use instead of the chapalote if there's too many downsides to the chapalote. So I wanted to hedge my bets and have like kind of a similar corn. So all three of these corns are from that same region, northeast or northwestern Mexico, Sinaloa, uh, Sonora, um, sort of the coast, the west coast of Mexico, but on the east side of the Gulf of California. So you can see this one is also kind of a small popcorn-y size kernels, mostly yellow, although there's some pretty white looking kernels in there. In this case, I'm gonna select the yellowest kernels instead of the whitest ones. See, they're pretty similar in shape and size to the chapalote. And this stuff is PI 490978. It's um, the official title of it is Sonora Group 11, and it's a flint. Um, it's uh, in the Onaveño Amarillo primary race. And this stuff has got a little bit of pinky orange pericarp in it, but I'm just going to ignore that stuff. It's also yellow. These kernels are a little bit bigger. And I don't know a ton about this corn. I kind of was just, you know, surfing on Grin, and this one just kind of met my search criteria. It was in the right region. It was in a slightly different, you know, primary race than the uh, the Chapalote, but um, Onaveño is another primary race that I'm interested in, and um, I don't have thus far really any corn genetics from this region of Mexico in my corn. So I'm, I'm exploring how they'll do here, because obviously we're in the Northeast, very different from like the conditions in Sonora and Sinaloa, but sometimes that matters and sometimes it doesn't, you know, different corns have different uh, adaptabilities and I'm not trying to keep these pure I don't you know you can't all the genes that these corns need to survive and do well in Sinaloa or whatever 
are not the same genes that they need to survive and do well here in the Northeast. But some of them are, you know, and I also want to have adaptability to changing conditions as climate change worsens, you know, and more diseases and problems come. You know, we had such a severe drought last year. It's not bad to have corns from the desert in the genetics of your corn, you know, because sometimes you're going to have deserty conditions like last year. So um, having corns with massive, robust, branchy, deep root systems, I think can only help us, you know, going forward as, you know, the world becomes a more risky place for, you know, food production, etc. You know, I'm not really a prepper, you know, and kind of what I do with a lot of my plant breeding is play around, but so the other thing is we use these corns for food for ourselves, you know, so I'm really interested in the ability that they have to provide, you know, good flavors and good textural qualities to tortillas or tamales and stuff. And if you want to do that, you really got to be looking for corns that are from places where people know what they're talking about when they're making tortillas and tamales, you know. And so, you know, corns from Mexico are where it's at. You know, there's so many different types of corn in Mexico and, you know, different preparations that they do with different corns. And that is a topic that is kind of hard to get information about in English, but it's something that just really interests me. It's really exciting, and I'm super interested to see what these corns will do and what they're like. And uh, hopefully some of them will have uh, the ability to uh, add, you know, special new specialness to, you know, our corn here on the farm. So... Hopefully that was interesting to people and uh, we'll obviously I'm going to make a lot of corn videos this year because I mean corn is one of the most fun things there is. So yeah. Okay. Thanks a lot for watching.